We're going to look at uh, the book of Acts here in just a minute. Um, but I want to uh, start by just kind of describing uh, what the Lord's been doing with me over the last week or so and some of the things that um, uh, the Lord has been teaching me. As you're probably aware, as you just simply turn on the news over the past um, years, our nation has been headed into uh, just moral um, debauchery and um, just a, a downward swing, and it's extremely difficult. It almost feels like Lot in some ways in the midst of an evil generation. It can be overwhelming. But I think as we turn to Scripture, as we look at the living God, this is precisely when God comes to the scene, when He uh, tears the curtain back and He intervenes in history and He shows His glory that no man would take any credit for that whatsoever. I personally am deeply encouraged as I look at what the living God is doing for this guilty and unworthy nation, the United States of America, as we see um, a generation of 25 uh, year and, and younger uh, students who are pursuing the Lord, who are drawing near to Him in a serious way and embracing old time religion. I've said before that one of my passions, I, I love church history. It's one of my favorite things, and a subcategory within ch uh, church history uh, would be historic revivals. Uh, it's a concept that in many ways is completely lost. We don't understand uh, the, the concept of what re revival is uh, biblically or historically. And the devil, he is a thief, and he would love to tear down the remembrance stones. He would love to tear down the things that God has done in the days of our fathers so that we could not stand up and call upon God to do the same thing in our day that He has done in past generations. And so I don't know if you've ever felt as though the Lord is leading you. God is, um, he is a, a shepherd. He, uh, within His nature, He is one who leads His people. He guides them. And I, I felt particularly as though the Lord really has been trying to encourage me and through me encourage this ministry with what is currently taking place. It was February 8th uh, where a generous uh, man gave me a, a portion of his library, some 400 books, and uh, one book really caught my eye. It was an account of the 1970 Asbury Revival. And I probably spent oh, uh, an hour or more studying that 1970 revival. At the exact time, without my knowledge, revival was breaking out in Kentucky and God at currently at Asbury. And then um, throughout, we've seen throughout our country, we've seen young people at our college campuses that are turning to God with a seriousness and embracing uh, the ancient faith. And so uh, the Lord has uh, been revealing His heart uh, to His servant. He knows I have a passion for revival, and I, I bless His name, and I thank Him for that. And so this last week, I felt led to go over to uh, Kentucky and simply be an observer to see what great things God is doing in our country. And I want to share uh, some of that as well as a turn to the Scripture. Um, in that Lexington area, it's a, it's a very special area in, in some ways for Christians. Number one, you have the Ark Encounter, and uh, Bobby, Mike, and I, we got to go see that. That is magnificent. It is um, so inspiring to see uh, how massive and, and grand that structure is. I would deeply encourage you to travel uh, to that area just to see the Ark in, Encounter, which is an emblem of, of God's salvation. Um, also, it's, it's pretty interesting coming from our heritage in the Churches of Christ. Uh, the uh, Cane Ridge Meeting House is about an hour uh, from uh, the Wilmore campus, and so we got to see that. And as a Church of Christ 
preacher, that's on my bucket list. I have dreamed about going to see the Cane Ridge Meeting House and to see those sacred grounds where some 30,000 people came to worship God and the Lord started uh, in part a movement that literally changed a nation. And we would not be here today if God had not shown His kindness. Uh, George Washington received some correspondence uh, shortly before the 1801 revival, and it uh, said, uh, I'm paraphrasing, basically the gentleman said, I'm, un- I'm more uneasy now than I was before the Revolutionary War because of the moral decline and the lawlessness uh, which was our nation prior to the Second Great Awakening. And he said, we're, we're headed to some event. I don't know what it is, but of course, Almighty God stepped in and we had a great spiritual move of God from 1790 to well into 1830 where the entire nation was at a time of spiritual uh, strength and and height and in a state of of revival. It's because of these events that we have had 200 deeply religious centuries. We're here because of that. And so... um, I just want to describe a little bit of uh, some of the things that, that I saw. It was incredible. We, are, we arrived on Monday at the Asbury campus. I've never seen anything like it in all of my life where people were arriving from different parts of the country. We get there, there's a, a gentleman, his face is glowing. He's so excited with radiant joy at what God is doing. He said, I came from Indiana. A man shows up and he said, I just got here from Arizona. Where do I go? And people from all across the, the union uh, were showing up and even around the world to experience and come to see what great things God was doing uh, in our nation. That past weekend, uh, they estimate that some 20,000 people tried to descend upon Wilmore, and there was a two uh, and a half mile, um, the, the road was blocked. People were not able to get there. The town was not able to sustain uh, the ferocious hunger and the desire to seek God and to cry out for mercy and to seek a revival uh, for our nation at this time. And so it's truly overwhelming. And I think that that was one of the things that I took away is to see a smile on everybody's face, uh, to see such a, a joy that was beaming from their countenances. We are bombarded by negativity as we see nothing but evil, as we um, believe it was the the Grammys recently, where it was just uh, a satanic worship service, people dressed up like devils, like our society has uh, reached all new lows and and darkness and immorality, but then to see the, the light of God cut the darkness and to see God reveal His arm and His glory and to turn thousands of young people into intense, uh, seeking and worshiping God, um, I, I personally have never seen anything like it. And so we get there, and there's a line to get into uh, the Hughes Auditorium that probably holds several thousand people. There were several thousand people waiting to get into this auditorium, and that was a beautiful sight. And the uh, weekend before, um, it would be hard to describe how many thousands of people were there on that front line. And so I want to say uh, that I am, the Lord has has encouraged me in the deepest part of my soul. Uh, I have prayed for revival, and I believe that the Lord is, is calling us to seek revival. Revival is nothing more than the New Testament church. It's when God revives His works. It's when the people of God uh, maintain their first love. And this is what God is calling us to in this, in this dark time. And so some of the key tenets of, of this movement would be as, as follows. Uh, it would be marked by confession of sin, a deep sense of repentance, uh, where hundreds of, of young people are broken before the Lord. Uh, there is a great 
uh, emphasis upon accountability before God, that we would come before the living God, that we would allow Him to search our hearts, uh, that we would be on our knees before Him, that we would be in the closet, and then at the same time, that there would be accountability before men, that on a weekly basis, that people would have other fellow Christians that would hold them accountable. They would ask them searching questions such as, is it well with your soul? These uh, classical tenets of our faith, it is marked by unceasing worship and prayer, by a noted um, presence of God. Can you imagine thousands of people coming with faith and expectation? These are things that we've, uh, many of us have experienced before. I've experienced many times at, at summer camp uh, where uh, God comes and, and reveals His presence and the Holy Spirit is working and, and there is a sense of conviction there. And also there is a total reliance in Jesus Christ as the only Savior of the world. And much like uh, our restoration movement, there is a great focus upon unity. It is such a beautiful thing to see all different types of people, um, every different race coming together, every different creed coming together to unify over the core tenets of the ancient faith. It really um, is such an inspiring, inspiring thing and the very uh, most needed thing um, for our, our nation at this time. I just want to uh, say the following. We need to be like the Bereans. We need to be discerning. We need to test the Scriptures. There are so many things that happen in the name of God that God is not a part of. And so it is right that we um, have a level of, of skepticism. We have a level of discernment. But I believe the expression is so very true, do not throw the baby out with the bathwater. We are a broken people. And we are a fallen race, and, and there's no perfect church, and there's always going to be dirty bathwater with any movement. There are going to be things that uh, don't completely line up with the Scriptures, but the Lord would have us to learn this principle to look at the precious baby, to look at what Christ is doing, to look at the spiritual earthquake which is rocking our nation and turning great multitudes of young people to uh, the living God and the historic faith. It is truly um, an, an amazing thing, and I think we should um, learn that principle. Um, also, I would note uh, the following historically, um, as one historian has noted as he's commented on some of the recent events, uh, God for some reason, he doesn't work during the times of, of spiritual lulls, but revival is his chosen means by which he saves nations. Uh, this is just simply a fact if you look at our uh, nation. If it had not been for the Great Awakening, if it had not been uh, for the second great awakening that exceeded the first great awakening, uh, we would not be here today. That's just a historical fact. And so in some ways, there needs to be a level of humility. We need to allow God to be God. He does not come down and consult um, preachers. He does not come down and consult uh, a human council of men before he decides to reveal uh, his mighty power and to move and to save. And so there needs to be a level of, of humility. And also we need to understand how God has worked um, historically. This text comes to mind, Isaiah 1.9 if the Lord of hosts had not left us a few survivors, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. If it had not been for the grace of God in this nation and in the West, if He had not smiled upon us, if He had not heard the fervent prayers of weak individuals crying out that religion might thrive and it might be uh, restored, we would not be here today. And so, um, 
as we consider criticism, it's, it's kind of like a, a, a farmer um, who, in, in the middle of a, of a drought, as the rain starts to, to pour down, uh, to, to complain and say, I, I don't believe in, in rain, or, or I don't want it to rain, or I'm skeptical of what's taking place. That's, that's um, pretty much hits home. That's the state that we're in. God's beginning to send heavenly rain, or it would be like a man that is dangling from a, a ledge, and he's uh, holding on to a, uh, a limb for him to despise that 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 limb, the very thing that is saving him in the same way, uh, that is uh, the way revivals work for this nation. If, if it had not been for revivals, uh, we simply would not uh, be here uh, today and, and our nation would surely have been ruined. And so this text uh, comes to mind this morning uh, in Stephen's speech in Acts chapter 7, verse 51, he gives an indictment uh, to the people of God. Uh, he says these words, and I want us to, to test our hearts. Um, I'm speaking this morning to myself, and I'm speaking to uh, the faithful. I'm speaking to church goers who uh, love the Lord, and I want us to to test ourselves by these, these words. Stephen's speech in Acts chapter 7, beginning in verse 51. Stephen says these words, You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you, which the prophets which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You have received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. It's hard to find a more severe and scorching indictment for the children of Israel uh, who were given so much light and so much blessedness was poured down upon them uh, for the sake of, of, of Christ. And yet we see here uh, Stephen's words that he says, they always resist the Holy Spirit. Which of the, which of the prophets that God sent to his people did they not uh, persecute. Uh, this word always in the Greek uh, means just that. It means always. Uh, what, a, what a strong indictment that, that every single time the living God wants to come and bring salvation to his people, when he wants to turn their hearts back to God, when he wants to um, lead them in the way everlasting, when he wants to raise up a mighty prophet and fill him with the spirit of the living God every single time, these religious people who have the word of God, they reject what God is doing. And I, I just pray for us this morning, once again, that we would have discernment, that we would have humility, that, that if God were to move to deliver us out of the mess that we've created, that he would come to deliver this Sodom and this Gomorrah, that we would be willing to receive the things that God has for us, that we would not harden our hearts, that we would not resist the Holy Spirit as the people of God did in past generations. Look at this text as well, Matthew 5, 10 and following. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And then along this same line, a parallel passage, 
John 1, 11, the fulfillment of mankind and the religious rejecting the Spirit of God is surmised in John 1, 11. He that is Christ came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Are you starting to get a picture here of the fundamental flaw of mankind, there is a tendency is within our nature to resist the light, to resist the things that God is doing in our midst. Uh, there's a funny story that I heard one time. There were some uh, apes that were uh, hanging out together, and they overheard a group of humans talking about Darwin's theory of evolution. And it was deeply offensive to them because they said, how can you associate us with the human race? We don't want anything to do with mankind because they are full of evil and treachery and uh, murder and every form of lawlessness. And isn't it interesting as we read these three scriptures, um, as we read what does the Word of God truly say about our person and our nature and our being, there should be a deep sense of, of, of humility when we look in the mirror and we see that we are a ruined race. We are a broken people. We often lack discernment, and as the Scripture says, uh, time after time we resist what God is doing. And so as we look at these Scriptures, I want us uh, to, to have a sense of, of discernment and to ask God, would you enable us by your mercy? Would you assist us by the Spirit to recognize what you're doing? And these scriptures suggest that sometimes Jesus could be standing right in front of our face and we could miss it, just like Martha. And so I don't know about you, but this life is really short. Uh, we are a vapor. We are here today, gone tomorrow. We don't get do-overs. I don't want to miss what the living God is doing right in front of my face. I want to receive Him. I want to be that type of person that God looks from heaven and says, William, my servant, I can use Him. If I speak to Him, He will listen. If I seek to, to use him, if I give him a task to do, he's not going to turn against me, but he's going to be faithful. He's going to follow me. He's going to hear my word. And on a natural level, there's so much suffering in this world. There are so many people that, that hurt and have needs, but many times there is a plain solution, but people are just not willing to receive that solution. The answer is right in front of their face, but they're not willing to take the hand that is reaching out to them on a spiritual level. We need to be uh, aware of that, that the people that God uses, the broken and the weak people all throughout sacred history that God inspires and empowers and comes upon are those people that are willing to receive Him. They're the minority. They are the faithful few, and we want to be within that number. And I, so, I hope you're, you're hungry for God. I hope you thirst for Him. I hope you want to see His glory. I hope you're not content to live um, in the moral decay that we currently find ourselves. I hope that you're not content to see the church languish. I hope you want to see these pews overflowing I hope you want to see God-sized things done. It's not about us. We are uh, we're ruined. We are weak. We are sinful. But it is all about the glory and the power of God. And so as we see the wonderful things which God is doing, which line up perfectly with our own history, which line up perfectly with what the Scripture teaches, 
I hope that we can desire to be right in the middle of that. I want to give you a word uh, this morning and maybe a first step uh, that we can take as a congregation as we try to be right in the center of what God is doing in our uh, country. I want you to think about this word, desperation. That is truly a word that um, is, is appropriate when we think about the gospel. Think about this word um, in, in, a, in a natural sense. Think about a father who seeks to save his, his child uh, from, from, from death, right? There's, there's literally nothing. You have that picture in your mind of, of a father and what desperation would mean in that, that context. And so it implies a single uh, focus. He doesn't have time to be engulfed in, in controversy and all these different things. He's focusing on one thing, saving his precious child. In the same way as we think in a, in a spiritual sense, as, as we think about uh, the realities of, of heaven and hell and, and the shortness of this life, um, as we come to, to see things the way God sees us, sees them, uh, desperation is, is, a, is a good first step. It implies a hunger for God. We've got to have God move in this community. I've got to be saved myself. My loved ones have got to be saved. The lost in this community have got to be saved. And so in a spiritual sense, uh, we should be desperate and that should lead us to say anything it takes Whatever it, it takes, Lord, that is a, an appropriate, rational response to the gospel to say, Lord, use me. What is the price tag to see your steadfast love continue and there be glory in the church in all generations? Lord, what do you want of your servant, William? Anything it takes. Do you, do you think if God were to look down, if he were to truly see the sincerity of a, of a church that was actually willing to take that step forward and say, Lord, we're desperate for you. We're desperate for Jesus, the Savior of the world. What would God not do? What great things would this group of people not see in response? God does not tease us. His promises are true, but they are conditional. It is if my people will call upon my name. It was if my people will humble themselves, if my people will show the sense of desperation, if they're willing to obey, if they're willing to step forward, if they have a true hunger for God, God is going to satisfy that hunger because he is faithful in the heavens. The problem with the United States of America and I am guilty of this as much as any other person, that we simply are not hungry enough for God. We simply don't want God. We don't want to see His salvation, and God is encouraging us to draw closer to His heart, to draw closer and to seek His face, to seek the promises of God. And so this morning, I am just... Um, encouraged uh, on, a, on a spiritual level, I see the living God working and showing His faithfulness and kindness in my own life in supernatural ways. I see God working in my country, and I bless His name. I Praise Him for what He is doing in this country. Thank you, Jesus, for the mercy that you are having upon this country, and I want more of it. And I want to encourage our congregation to be receptive. Lord, what does that look like? We're, we're, we're broken. We don't have the answers. How do we reach this community? Lord, help us to do those things. We obviously need to draw closer. We all obviously need to take some steps forward, but that's, those are the things that we are uh, praying through um, over the next uh, period of time. And so this morning, if you do not have a personal 
relationship with Jesus. I would encourage you to fix your eyes upon Jesus Christ, who is the one Savior of the world who died, was buried, and rose again on the third day, who ever lives currently to offer remission of sins and kindness for those who come to Him according to the Scripture. Uh, He has commanded that we would repent, that we would be immersed in water, be baptized for the forgiveness of our sins, uh, that we might receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and come out of those baptism waters and follow Him all the days of our lives, walking according to the Holy Spirit. If you would like to take the Lord up on that greatest of all promises, I would encourage you to come forward this morning. If there are any other prayers of the church, this is an appropriate time to come forward as we stand and sing our song of invitation.